Welcome back to the Raspy Rundown. So happy yeah. to be here. Today, we actually have one of our favorite guests, Morgan Field. She was here with us when we first started the podcast. I think she was one of our first guests and we had her on and that was my most favorite episode talking about manifestation and life and just how to have your best life and live your best life. And since we've had Morgan on last, we have both relocated. I am in California and you are in Ocala. And I would just love to catch up and see where you are at, how you made the trans transition to Ocala. Cause I know, you know, moving is such a big deal, but I feel like you have really found your tribe and you are so happy. And I think for everyone out there listening, it could really benefit you if you don't feel like you're grounded where you are or you're not in the space surrounded by the certain people that you really feel that you connect to. There's always a way to make that move and it might turn out better than you could have ever thought. So I would love Morgan for you to share some of that and your journey since we've last spoken. I think even on the last podcast, we talked about how you, it was literally right before you moved to LA and right before I moved to Ocala. I can't remember if I shared that that was the place I had selected or that the universe selected for me. But what I think is really interesting about this move and how it's maybe even more different than other moves I've done in the past is when I first got this vision of the Miami chapter was closing. I heard Ocala. I didn't know where it was. I had never been there before. Um, and because I didn't have the logic to match the intuition, which is something I work with a lot of my clients on, right? How do we just allow the intuition to be what it is instead of the logic needing to match it? Because the logic didn't match it, I dismissed th that voice. And then I like, was like, okay, where might I go? And I started taking all these different trips to different locations to see what would be a really good next location, not only for me, but also for my business. Um, and wouldn't you know, like each of the places I'd go to, I went to like Tampa, I went to Asheville, I went to all these different places and nothing really felt right, right? So sometimes I think we try to make decisions from our brain, where am I gonna go next? Right. But we are very sentient beings, right? And so it's often like, we need to feel on that next, like it has to feel really good to us. And so, um, I felt like I got this challenge from my spirit guides and the challenge was, we want you to just go to Ocala and you're not going to have, uh, you're, we're not even going to like give you a, like, you're not going to book anything. You're literally just going to go and we will guide you while you're there. So it's very much like a trust fall, a surrender fall. And the moment I stepped into Ocala, one thing after another, after another was like all these green lights of like, yes, this feels amazing. I met the tribe that I spend time with now. Cause I've been here, you know, so I've been here about six months now. Oh, wow. I met them the day I was in Ocala. Like the, the, the person who I'm the closest to, I met that particular day. And then that person introduced me to like this whole new world. And I feel like so often what happens is our heart guides us to something new, but we're so afraid to make the change. And when you truly do listen, when you truly surrender, all this magic opens up, right? And I couldn't get my grounding, like my vibrational center. I couldn't get that inside of a, a big city. I just couldn't. That just, I just was, it was too overstimulating for me. And when I got here, it was like my entire energy field breathed. It was my entire, it was like having oxygen again inside of my world that had been missing for a long time. I think that's really relevant to what's going on in the world today, right? right? Is a lot of us are in, in situations where maybe we didn't even realize it wasn't a fit until we had to spend quarantine, right? By ourselves inside of that. And then for me, once the world got busy again in Miami. I was like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> After having yeah. so much calm during right. quarantine, I really enjoyed quarantine. Um, so yeah, so I'm here. I hang out with horses. I get to do my work with the horses here and with the animals here, which has been a really great location for that. I have this amazing community of people that I've met that I've just really hit the ground running as far as just the like-minded souls, the support, the love, Oh, I feel so deeply nourished. And I feel like 
this quantum leap of faith really brought me to feeling probably for the first time ever, like I'm home. Like I'm at oh. home in my body. I'm at home in this location. I'm home with my friends. I have a question, Morgan, as far as your training for what you do with animals and people, how does that differ? What is your training that, you know, you have ventured upon with the horses as well as your training with your dog, Teddy, who you might want to talk about a little bit, bring people up to speed with when you got Teddy, was Teddy involved in this process when you went to Ocala, Ocala, um, or was that something you did on your own? But more importantly, what do you do with the horses and the animals and how does that differ from what, from what you do with your, your human clients? Um, so you, yeah, basically for people that may have not listened to the other podcasts when you were on. So I'm going to dissect each of those little nuances of question <laughs> and try to, to break it down. So the first piece it feels like to just feel into is I got Teddy right at the end of December of 2020. And when I got him, I heard this message that I was going to have a being come be with me that was going to help me understand how to partner with animals in a completely new way. And as we walked into our journey, it was this partnership of him really helping me understand the vibration of overstimulation which is, you know, in this world right now, like mental health, anxiety, overstimulation, right? And it's something that a lot of my clients as empaths that they really have to learn how do I navigate this world with such a sensitive nervous system, with such a mm -hmm. sensitive extrasensory experience. So I, I have learned more about myself as a psychic energetic being partnered with Teddy than I have with any other partnership I've had with animals before. So it's pretty profound. It's absolutely amazing. It is incredibly challenging and wildly rewarding at the same time. Um, so when you partner with an animal, he's actually a psychiatric service dog is what he's in training for. So he's with me 24 seven and there's a big difference in working with, you know, if I go work with horses, I'm with a horse for maybe an hour. Mm -hmm. Right. If I am working with Teddy, I mean, this is something that is like a really, really deep bond. I also feel like I'm learning the nuances of how to partner with an animal in a way that could help other people understand how do you partner with maybe your own pets or for other people helping them open up an option to what is an emotional support animal, what is a psychiatric service dog, et cetera. So there's like all these different layers of portals of doors that are opening inside of this experience. When I do animal communication as an animal communicator, when I do animal communication work with horses or with another person's animal, that's not my own. Um, what I do is I am able to, so, so animals and babies, they communicate energetically and telepathically, right? Humans, we learn this very archaic, chunky, heavy density of language called words, right? Yeah. So for me, it's infinitely easier to communicate with an animal or a baby because they haven't learned all of these complex things that, you know, you could say one word and I could, it could mean something completely different to me. Right. Whereas energy is energy and energy doesn't lie. So the cool thing about animals is I literally just am able to walk into their energetic field or, you know, I can do this virtually or I can do it in person. And I'm able to feel into like literally energetically what's going on in their emotional field, in their physical field, in their musculatory field, in their vibrational field. Like there's all these layers of nuance of energy that can communicate to us. And I teach other people how to do it. But for me, I think it's just something I've always done because I was so connected with this language of sentience, this language of sensory. I was so connected to it and I never lost the connection of how to communicate this way. So for me, I think it was just something that I've always done. And then I stumbled across how to do it more effectively, the more that I've gone, if you, um, if you will, just with practice, but, um, yeah. And so what's really cool is, you know, 
if you are in another being's energy field, I can do this with humans too, but if you're in another being's energy field, they can tell you what's going on in their physical body that sometimes maybe even a doctor wouldn't be able to detect or not even a doctor, but like a technology that we have in the medical world. Um, the body can talk to us, right? The, there are, you know, when I scan, let's say I'm scanning a horse's body or I'm scanning a human's body, if I'm doing Reiki, there, the chakra points on a physical body have data files and the data files can give me information about memories that are storing energetic trauma points that if we pull up the memory and we cleanse the memory, it can actually scrub the energy from their energy field. Or sometimes then I'll get information of how do you um, help this being shift and, and transmute their energy so that it is no longer stuck and it goes back into flow. And then with humans, um, I can do that work as well, but I also, what ends up happening is with humans, there's so much more ego right? There's so much more mind. So something animals and babies don't have yet, right? Um, animals don't develop. It's this layer of thinking. The overthinking. The constant yeah. Thinking. Not that they're not thinkers. Yeah. I, right. I actually think they're incredibly intelligent. I think um, that in terms of ascension, they're a higher vibration than we are, but yeah, they don't develop the overthinking. They don't develop the stories. They don't develop the, um, what does this mean about me? Mm -hmm. Right. So for them, if I'm seeing something in their, in their energy, I know that it's going to be, even if it'll be a process, it's like the animals on board to work through it. And all we have to do is get their nervous system and their energy field, primed for a new experience. And then it's like, we're good. Right. Um, with a human, we get into loops. We get into story loops. I mean, me too. Hello. I'm human also. Right. Like we create stories about what things mean. Like say I'm say when I'm a child, you know, I need my mom or dad's attention and they don't give it to me. And I feel abandoned by that. Right. And then I'm like, what does that mean about me? I'm not worthy for this. And then I carry that until I die. Right. And like that, that can happen. That can literally happen. Right. Whereas as an adult, when you start doing some of this work to really recreate the stories or like recreate the moments that created these stories and then rewrite them, you start, you can look back and go, oh, like my mom was on the phone. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. like, oh, you know, kids are a lot of energy and I, you know, maybe I wanted attention 24 seven or, you know, I, I'm just right. making this up. Right. But, and so you start to, to be able to rewrite and go, oh, it actually had nothing to do with me. So one of the things I tell myself a lot and um, comes up a lot with clients is this piece of someone else's capacity whether it's their capacity for truth or their capacity for love or their capacity for intimacy or their capacity for presence or depth, someone else's capacity has nothing to do with my worth. It has nothing to do with my lovability. It has nothing to like, if someone can't see what I see, it doesn't mean what I see isn't valid. Mm -hmm. And that was especially important and is huge in the work I do with clients because that, that last piece of validity, because oftentimes when we're trying to work on cultivating your intuition, which is a lot of what I do with the human clients um, is your, there are going to be so many memories from your past and your current where you believe something to be true, right? Like I got that hit. I said earlier where like, Oh, Ocala is, you know, it's like Ocala is the next place. Um, but it's not validated externally. Right. right. No one else is validating it or it doesn't make logical sense. And so then we put it to the side instead of going, well, hold on a second. Why don't we hold this? Why don't we move with this? Why don't we dance with this? Why don't we allow this to be the predominant thing that moves us forward? And then you start to watch, you know, I, I watch clients come in who, I mean, you could already even be living a life you really enjoy, right? But you're just, maybe something's missing and you don't know what, and you want that like extra soul on fire energy. 
And um, that comes from developing your intuition, developing your connection with your heart and knowing what's the difference between your fear and what's the difference between your intuition. So yeah, whereas with animals, I don't have to teach them intuition. They're just incredibly intuitive and horses are incredibly psychic. So I enjoy working with them too. Do you have a couple of clients like that you see on a daily or you know weekly basis? Like how does this work? Is this part of a volunteer organization that you do in a, you know, coupled with your, with your um, people job, you know, your human job, or is this a job that you do on a regular basis working? You know what I mean? Like you, with the horses. Yeah. With the horses and the animals. Like, um, yeah, no, I actually, I, I take animal sessions the same way I would take human sessions. So in my okay. booking system, it's literally someone can book a session to work with themselves. They can book a session to work as couple. They can book a session to work, uh, to do an animal communication session. I can work with an animal that is alive and in this human dimension, or I can channel an animal that has crossed over. I mean, there's so many different things that can be done inside of the same skill set. I guess if you're looking for like the umbrella of the skill set, it's, you know, since I was little, I've always had the ability to walk multiple dimensions, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm able to be in this human experience, seeing and sensing all of the five senses and the things you guys would see. And then I've always had this arsenal of extrasensory soul gifts that allow me to communicate with, you know, even as a child, I used to see spirits and just allows me to have a line of communication. Mine is predominantly auditory, but I'll get visions. I can actually feel energy. Like if in this moment you said, okay, feel into what's going on in your body and your energy, I could boom, I could just channel right into what's going on in your physical body, what's going on in your emotional body, what's going on in your mental body, what's going on in your energy. It's just, I I joke now with clients, like it's like the X-Men are coming together, right? It was, you know, if, if we're these superhuman beings, out in the world and we're having this very extrasensory experience and no one else around us understands it, then we can eventually start to think like, man, there's something, maybe there's something wrong with us. When you start to get together with other beings who are also having very sensory experiences. And I think the world as a whole, I think humanity as a whole is coming more and more online with their, how sentient we are. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's happening as we look at, you know, what's going on globally in the world as the world gets wonkier and wackier, we are all feeling that energy. And so I, I personally believe that we are all empaths in one way or another, in terms of like that we, that we have access to be able to have that sentient experience of literally feeling what is going on in the world around us. But some of us don't actually know that what we're picking up is not ours, right? So uh, one of the things I like to do too is like, if I'm experiencing something, I might message a friend and be like, hey, is is your world feeling wacky and wonky? You know, and they're like, oh yeah, actually. And if like three of my different friends that are all, all sentient beings are experiencing like extra heightened anxiety, I'm like, oh, cool. That's usually my sign and symbol that what I'm experiencing isn't just mine, right? right? And I think that's something that we get to practice more and more as we go through this escalation of, um, polarity that's happening in our world and division that's happening in our world and really start to give ourselves permission to go, okay, everything I'm feeling usually isn't always mine. Mm -hmm. Right. And figuring out like what's mine and what's not mine and really pausing and going, Hey, is it possible? I picked up a friend's bad mood. Is it possible? I, you know, I picked up a stranger's mood. Is it possible? I'm just feeling into what's going on in the world and it's making me sad. It's like, yes, all of those things are possible. And I think it's really confusing because it's so um, integral what you're speaking about. And a lot of times I feel like, oh, I'm psychic. I just, you know, like I'll have like the other day, Alexander sent me something that she did. I was really proud of. I sent it to a friend and literally my girlfriend says to me, oh my God, how do you, you should start monetizing your psychic ability. I literally was just retelling a story of when I was with you the other day to my husband. And as I said, Debbie, boom, that's when my text about my daughter, Alexandra came through to her. So she's like, you should monetize this. So what I get really confused about Morgan is what is the difference between, and this happens all the time to me. I'll be talking about someone and they call me or they write me or I vice versa. What is the difference between that 
thing that I just did to my friend and something where you have such a heightened awareness to be able to go into a room with animals and know like maybe somebody's asking you, my animal's just seeming sluggish and he's not, he doesn't seem right. They may not call a vet right away or they might have a vet and they want to have you come to reinforce or give another opinion as to the depth of what's going on the horse's soul. What is the difference between something like that and something like I've experienced? That's where I'm a little confused. Like, it sounds like you have an ability much deeper that you were gifted versus me. I think a lot of people don't tap into the ability. I feel like there's a lot more people who have it, but they never tapped into it. They've never, whether it was growing up, they were told this is wonky or they just never tapped into that. And I feel like there's so many more people who have the gift. They just don't know how to use it or don't even know or just brush it off as coincidences. Am I right? Oh, a million percent. That's why I said, I believe we are all sentient. I believe we're all gifted. I believe we're all, you know, when I say empath, it's like, uh, let's say, I believe we're all empaths, but there are some of us who are activated empaths who are openly tapped in, tuned in, and still connected to that gift. Um, And then there's a huge spectrum of activation, right? So you're looking at someone who is just not only was aware of my activation as a child, right? So for whatever that means, maybe it didn't get squashed before I had memory. I don't know. Right. right? But I had that access as a child. And then I, uh, went through a period of time where it sounds like where you are, where it's like, I wasn't really sure what I was doing and what it was. Right. And then I went through a period of, I would call my blackout years where I completely turned it off and just drank for like 13 years of my life. And then I came into this thing where it was like, oh, I have some gifts here. Let me cultivate them. So what you're seeing in the gifts that I'm sharing with you are, yes, they are from my natural essence, but I believe we all have them in our natural essence, right? But they are, they've been cultivated for, you know, I'm 39 going on 40. So we're, we're going on a 10 year cultivation. And when I say cultivation, I mean, I'm like really big into mastery. So if I'm trying to cultivate something, it's a daily thing, right? So if you were to focus on that thing, this thing that you're not really sure what it is, you're like, what is this thing? Oh, this is interesting. If you just practiced and cultivated and got curious and spent more and more time playing with it, experimenting with it, tracking it, you're going to get more and more confident in it. It's not necessarily like we're growing your intuition. We're growing your confidence in your intuition, but right? Because we're all already intuitive. Right. People just need to tap into that and trust. I feel like a lot of times I don't always trust my intuition and I'll go in situations and I'll know it feels wrong, but I'll just push it aside or I'll be like trying to find the reasons it's not what I think it is. But then it's always like, I just need to come to terms with the intuition and cut it off or know for what it is, because it's always going to end up back at where I first thought it was. Like, let me also just say this. And this is the reason I shared that example of I heard the message of Ocala and I dismissed it. Right. I am someone who is so deeply and intimately connected to my intuition that, well, and if it, if a message came in for, you know, either one of you, it would be so easy for me to be like, it's a hundred percent this, no doubts. Right. But when you're channeling for yourself is where you can get even more in your own way. So Debbie, that may be something for you to play with as far as giving yourself the opportunity to look at maybe holding space for someone else because you're less tangled, you're less attached. Like actually your question about the difference between, you know, Teddy, my dog and, um, you know, me channeling for horses, I'm more likely to get tangled if I'm trying to hold space for a channel for Teddy because I have all these other energetics playing in because I'm so connected to him. Whereas if it's someone else's animal, I have zero entanglement and I'm literally just able to hold the space with absolutely, you know, usually the animals I channel, I've never even met. So, um, it's, it's about, I, I, I shared that Ocala hit with you and that I dismissed it. I shared that with you so that you realize that even when you cultivate it, it doesn't mean the doubt ever really goes away. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but you can well, decrease the amount of time between when you hear the message and you actually surrender to the message. And the even lot, though, yeah. Yeah. Well, cause I, a lot of times like this happens, like um, very weird, like with this one friend, me and her, I mean, Alexander and I and another friend, but my one friend, Tao, her and I always have these things. I told this story when on our first podcast, I believe, when I interviewed 
interviewed you where her and I were walking, we were taking lots of walks. And this is during like the, the very beginning of when pandemic hit. And every time we would walk by this, um, this fake, I think they were fake dogs, you know, I don't know what you call them. They're like made out of our bear, you know, the greenery. And then we decided to name them. And I came up the, with the most random Phineas name. And when I said it, she was like, oh my God, I was gonna say that. Not cookie, not like a normal dog name. That was one time. There's all these little things that always happen to us. And so I would say you have to tap into it and actually like, you know. But I don't do it intentionally. Like right. so Alexander and I were having a conversation. Oh, she was proud of this moment. I sent it to a couple people, Tao being one of them. And at that moment is when Tao said that to me, oh my God, you must be psychic. I literally just said your name, Debbie. Same thing happened with this friend Tao. Um, what happened was we were talking on the phone, talking on the phone. I randomly called her um, and had a question for her. And we started talking about everything under the sun because she did a lot of background work in the city. And when she got back to her house, she then at that moment said, oh my God, did your friend's husband pass? And I said, what? And she read that a friend of mine that just literally relocated to Georgia, her husband had just died. At that moment, I was like, oh my God, if I wasn't on the phone with you, I would never have known. Like I didn't, I would never have looked on my phone at the newspaper online for our town. So because, and this was all because my other daughter asked me a question to ask my friend Tao about the background work. So if my well, it daughter- It sounds like it's intuition that you need to yeah. accept so and tap into. I mean- I would never have called Tao. like make sense of it, but I just think it's like- Same person. So because of Tao, I found out my friend's husband died. Like yeah. multiple things happened like this. Continue. Yeah. So what I would recommend for people is that they keep an intuition log because we as humans have awesomeness amnesia. We have the amnesia. It's literally part of what we signed up for this experience is that we're going to forget that we're souls having a human experience. We're going to forget that we're these majestic, magical, divine beings. We're going to forget that. It's literally a part of the agreement and in coming into this experience. So with that being said is when you keep an intuition log, and you write down all of those in one place. Right. And then the next time you get a hit or something happens, you add it to the list. What ends up happening is you start to build the confidence in your intuition so much so that you have so much proof because that's really what the mind wants, right? Mm -hmm. That's what science is. It's, it's proof yeah. that matches stuff that, you know, maybe spiritual people have been talking about forever. Um, right. And so it's like, okay, if your mind needs proof to get on board, then it will be, this list will be the proof, right? right? It will allow you to have something to go back to and go, man, there's something here. Like, even as you're saying this, what, what came up is cause, cause this is like this part of being so incredibly um, intuitively connected to your own intuition is also then being connected to others through thought channels, right? That's telepathy. Yeah. You're connecting through a thought channel. So you don't need the words, which is what happened with you and your friend when you named the animal, the same name. Um, I think back to when, um, Alexandra, when you were moving and I was moving and we were moving within like a week and a half or two weeks of one another from the same building, we were living in the same building in Miami and I wanted wardrobe boxes. I can't remember if we talked about this in the yeah. last podcast. No, I don't know if we did, but yeah. And um, I just had this vision, right, of this desire of wardrobe boxes. And intuition is usually just so, it, it, it literally comes and it goes. It just comes in, it flows, it's peaceful, it's not heavy. Fear is usually like spinny and heavy and contracting. But it was just this like little thought and it, it went away. I went downstairs to, we had this um, room in our building where it was kind of, it was like the recycle room where everyone would put their boxes. And I went down there to look to see if anyone had put packing boxes because I, you know, it was like, whatever, free packing boxes. And sure as shit, Alexandra had put extra wardrobe boxes that she didn't need. And then when I was like, holy crap, I literally thought of this, went downstairs and found this and it was, I'm getting goosebumps and it was, it was yours. I right. Know. And, and then she goes, Oh my God, my dad accidentally ordered extra. Uh huh. Right. And then yeah. I didn't need it. And then she goes, I didn't even think to think to ask you. Right. But it's like, <laughs> that's the connect. Like 
when you're connected, so your intuition also then connects you to other beings, which is all right. I'm doing. I just know how to connect to the other beings. Yeah, I feel like that happens to me all the time, the other beings, always. Yes. And so that, that's that layer of like, we're, we are all connected and especially those that you allow into your heart, that you allow to reside in your energetic real estate, you're connected to them, right? right. That can either be a wonderful, pleasurable experience, like going downstairs and finding wardrobe boxes from someone you love. And you're like, holy shit, how cool is this a little gift from the universe? Or it could be a nightmare if you're tethered energetically to someone who has a vibration that is completely in contrast to that which you desire, right? So um, there's a shadow side to, to that as well. And it's just something that, you know, then we, we have to, or we get to be super vigilant of understanding the craft of intuition and understanding the craft of energy, right? Energy mastery. I'm writing a third book. That's all about energy mastery. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, oh it's so, oh, it's so good. And, okay. um, but it break, the way I write books is I ask the channel of the soul of the book that's channeling through me. I ask it to bring me through the experience first. So every book I write usually kicks my ass during the process. Right. So just know that, um, it will be so deeply, uh, understood, whatever, it, whatever we're experiencing inside of energy mastery, right. It's like, we, we really get to learn how to curate and cultivate these, a divinely majestic energetic experience for ourselves. Right. right? Which I believe includes developing our intuition, knowing the difference between fear and intuition, not allowing our fear to control us. It's also knowing which beings to connect to that are very nourishing to us, yeah. right? And how do we bubble out the beings that are that we don't want to absorb their energy? Because that's the other thing too, is um, as sentient beings and as activated empaths, um, we absorb energy. Like mm -hmm. we are literally like sponges, right? And so we absorb energy from the world around us. Those are every client I work with in some way, shape, form, or fashion is an empath. And and an empath is just essentially someone who has that activated sixth sense, right? Right. You call it your intuition. You could call it your feeler, your knower. You just have that extra, it, it extends beyond the five senses. And this is where you get into this, like, okay, I'm literally connected to this. There's something going on energetically around me and I can feel it, whether it's feeling other people's thoughts or their feelings or, or what have you. So what happens inside of that though, then is and we don't teach this in school. There was no class, right? So it's not like we missed the class and we missed out on learning this. It's just It's not taught because we don't teach the, the language of sentience is we literally are programmed then to just absorb. We absorb, we absorb, we absorb. It's like a default programming, right? The standard equipped programming. But when you start to play in energy mastery and when you start to cultivate your intuition and play with all of these layers of what it means to be an energetic being in a human body suit, you, you get to start to control the vibration where it's like you literally go inward and you can broadcast out and you have more opportunities to curate and experiment with and play. How do you orchestrate the energy around you instead of always just absorbing? It's like knowing, okay, I'm going to absorb. So like when I go into someone's, if I do a session with someone, I will open up the energy I will go into their energy. I will find whatever I need to find or answer any questions they have or whatever. And then I will leave the energy, right? Right. Because I have learned how do I go in and how do I come out? Right. So you don't take it with you. Yes. That is something that I have such mastery on with clients. Um, but then it's like when you get into a relationship, right? Or when you're in friendships or when you're in community, it becomes even harder to like, like I don't want to go in, find and leave. Right. Cause it's like, how do you get to be in someone's energy and connect to them, but then without being like drowning, right. How right. do I get to be in someone else's energy without losing myself? And, um, those are pieces of current research experimentation that I'm in for this third book. Um, it's wild, it's crazy, but it's amazing and it's beautiful. And the only way for us to really get to cultivate these things is to go through it. Right. right? And find different ways of how do we play with it? So what would you say, because I think a lot of times 
Empaths also could suffer from anxiety of sorts because if you're taking on all of this energy from people you're really close to in your daily life and then you see things happening in the news, I mean, you work yourself up. What, what are some tips to detach from that? Or even like, what is a correlation in your mind between empaths and the anxiety that comes along with that? Oh, amen, sister. Um, as I have expanded my psychic senses, as I've expanded my sensory experience to get more and more able to feel, sense, know, and connect with beings in this dimension and other dimensions, and as it, as I expand and increase and escalate all of that, vibrationally, my nervous system um, is more inclined to get overstimulated. Right. Right. And overstimulation is perceived in this dimension of consciousness as anxiety. So I think the first thing would be if, if you can give yourself permission to say, to, to start to look at it as it's overstimulation. Right. And it's not anxiety. Yeah. Um, it is anxiety, right? It's how it's the label that the world gives it, but there's a negative stigma to anxiety. So it's like, if we can look at it as, okay, I'm literally just overstimulated. I have a threshold here. So this would be one of the tips I would say is, when you're feeling anxiety, really look at what are the, th- where are the thresholds of stimulation that I'm accidentally crossing from stimulation into overstimulation, mm-hmm. right? So um, that would be like, you know, you could have a couple chocolates and that would be delicious, Oh, right. So that could be stimulating. It could be nourishing. It could feel really good. But if you have 12 boxes of chocolates, right? We're in an overstimulation. This is a metaphor for your, for your energy, right? So it could be, you have a friend who you absolutely love and adore and you've been friends for a really long time. And you have a threshold of like, you guys can be together for about two or three hours and it's really nourishing to both of you. But if you try to go beyond that amount of time, because maybe you live in just completely different experiences or because uh, there's infinite reasons why it could happen, right? But if you cross that threshold of the amount of time that's actually healthy for the two of you to spend together, this could happen with family too, right? Family could be great for like 48 hours and then you spend 72 hours and everyone's fighting. Um, And it's because there, there are energetic thresholds that if we pay attention to and we can align them, then we can really set ourselves up for success. But when we cross them and we go, you know, but I don't want to hurt their feelings or yeah, but, and, you know, I haven't seen them in a while and, you know, maybe it'll be different this time. And we talk ourselves out of our intuitive knowingness of our connection to what our energy needs. Um, then we actually put ourselves and the beings around us in a situation where we're going to cross our overstimulation threshold. Right. And then, you know, it's like, that's where panic attacks can happen. I get those as well. Um, that's where that's where the explosions happen. That's where we're no longer in control of what our nervous system is doing. Cause our nervous system is trying to regulate itself since you won't regulate it for you. Right. It's like, no problem that the body actually, this helped me redefine panic attacks and, and feel more like hand in hand in partnership with them. Um, it's this message came through, um, through spirit where it's like, if you just realize that your body is like this divine, intelligent, being that is trying to partner with you. And if you can't honor your own boundaries, it's going to honor it for you by going into its own self-regulation mode where it starts to hyper, you can hyperventilate, you're crying, you're breaking down. It literally just, it works you up. It is just trying to say, Hey, I am signaling to you that there is a boundary that you need to put in place, or there's some sort of threshold of which there you're crossing that you're going into overstimulation. And when you can find it, so sometimes you have to have the panic attack or you have to experience the anxiety to be able to reverse engineer what it was. But when you can find the root and the trigger, that's where, you know, Hey, focus on that. That's your work. So I think with anxiety, if we can just be more conscious of that same thing, right? Like if you're watching news 24 seven, first of all, I haven't watched news in probably 10 years. Right. Oh, wow. That was one of the yeah. first things I cut out when yeah. I um, became conscious of my energy. This is overwhelming. Yes. As an empath, 
you feel, hear, sense, and know not just what's being said, but what's not being said. And also the vibration it's being said in or not being said in and uh, the intention underneath it. So it's like a lot of the media energies at times will create you know, like I think of in Miami, the, when there's a hurricane, right. It's like fear bomb, fear bomb, fear bomb. And, you know, and it just works the system up, works the system, you know, and then I can't breathe. And then it's like, oh, everything was fine. (gasps) Everything is fine. You know? And so it's just, um, the meme that comes to mind is I saw something on social media that said, there's some poor, I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to make this in my language. It's like, there's some poor bastard underneath a waterfall, a waterfall in this world, having the peaceful time of his life that has no idea that, you know, he, he doesn't have a phone and he has no idea that he's supposed to be afraid of so many things right now in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, I want to be that poor bastard. I want to be the person that doesn't have my phone that doesn't have access to the, um, the news. And I trust that if there's something that I need to pay attention to, my body will feel it. Mm -hmm. But isn't isn't there a a balance where you need moderation because you do have to still stay informed with the media and what's going on in the world to be smart and make good choices. But at the same time, you don't want to overstimulate yourself to become, if you're one of these people that's very sensitive to everything around you. So for example, what's going on in Ukraine, you know, it's, it's, it's a real fear. It can have a ripple effect on so many levels for so many of us. How do you stay in the mindset where you're, you know, informed in the news without watching the news and yet sensitive to what's around you and others um, and your okay. clients, like what your clients are going Yeah. With. Again, I'm going to try to break it into micro pieces. So okay. um, let me just feel into that. There's um, the first thing that's coming through is the question you're asking is one of the most common questions I do get from people when the guidance that comes through in a session for them is to do a news cleanse. It is that exact, yeah, but I want to stay in in tune, right? Um, The question you're asking me specifically, if you're asking me, like, how do I not do it and be informed for me specifically, it's because I don't have the fear you have, whatever you're asking a question to me, like, but how do you stay informed? And what I, my answer to that personally, and then I'll answer what a client, a difference for someone else, like me personally, I know and trust so deeply and intimately in my intuition that I know if something was wrong, I would feel it. If there was something going on in the world, I needed to be, I would feel it. And then I would find it. So I feel first, find later. Okay. Right. Instead of bombarding yourself with all the information and then going through, should I be scared of this? Should I fear this? Instead of finding it, you say, well, if I have a real problem, even in the world or in my own life, it'll come to me. And then I can say, okay, should I look into this? Is something wrong here? Yes. The other thing is, um, if people do choose, like, if you do want to stay informed, my question would be, get really curious as to why, like, what is it? Are you, is it because it's fear porn? subconsciously and you don't even realize you're doing that to yourself. Like maybe you enjoy getting kicked up a little bit. Maybe there's some, maybe there's some sort of like addictive pull to that buzz. Right. Um, I don't know. I'm just, it's it's like just being aware of like, sometimes we buy our own bullshit. Like sometimes we, um, sell ourselves a story that we need something that we don't actually need because it's more of an addictive pull. If you, but even if you don't go after it, like yourself, you, Morgan, yeah. you can't help but be surrounded by it and when you go to the grocery store, where you see it on the newspaper, in the newspaper, if you hear talk, people talking about clients bringing it up. So even if you're not seeking it out, it sometimes will be just surrounded by you. She like, doesn't live in fear, so she doesn't take it with her. Right, not to be fearful, but just to be, you might just. You she, doesn't, she doesn't let it bother her. You don't let it bother you. but, you, so but I don't even. I don't eat, like when you just said you go to the grocery store, I'm like, where is there news at the grocery store? Like I, it doesn't, and there probably is, but I, because it's talking, or your friends or clients yeah. questions. Oh, what about this thing with Ukraine? Or what about the earthquake in California? If you were living in California or, you know, different things or just that come up in the world. I, not even it doesn't have to be weather or whatever, but yeah. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is because it's not on my radar of consciousness, it's not even coming up. Okay. Like, um, 
it goes back to, I think it's called the reticular activation system. It's where, you know, um, I think I did this exercise with you guys last time, but let's do it again, just because it's so powerful, right? It's like, uh, look around your room, right? Right now, listeners to like, look around the room, just kind of take in, just look around. Mm-hmm. Okay, close your eyes. Um, what did you see that was purple? That's so crazy you said that. I was just thinking of my purple keychain that's right next to me. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I was like, and if she says purple, I know I have my keychain. I didn't see anything purple. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now open your eyes. You, I got you that keychain. Yes, you did. I bought her that shirt with her. Okay, it so, says manifest, by the way. So two, so two things. One is we just got an exercise in Alexandra's intuition is on fire. Okay. Right. So how cool is that? So if you're listening it's like, Oh my God, I knew she was going to say purple. Right. It's like, that was your intuition. Um, the other thing that we just got an example of is open your eyes and look around and now look for purple. Right. You see it everywhere now. Do, do you see Debbie, do you see purple in your, anywhere in there? Well, I don't see purple, but am I supposed to see it? Did my room is gray, red, or am I supposed to see purple floating? No, it would literally be like, floating. is there Oh, well, oh, yes. I have a beautiful purple statue. Okay. A gorgeous oh, that exactly I bought in Italy, my favorite statue. Okay. I bought this on our honeymoon in Murano. It's two figures together and it's purple. Okay. okay. Let me, let me give you, let me tie this together. No, this is perfect. This is perfect. Oh, I see. <laughs> what you just did is exactly why I don't see the news when I'm out. Cause it's not even on my radar. Right. So uh-huh. I don't, people could be having a conversation about it. It could be blasted on a billboard. It could be, I don't even see it. It's wow. not on my consciousness. I didn't even see it. I didn't even see it. It's not on your conscious. Hello. But the minute I said, see the purple, right. it's on your consciousness. I even said, by the way, I even said, see the purple and you couldn't see it until I pushed it and put, <laughs> right. That is how deeply ingrained I am in the opposite. Wow. Like, news is my purple. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Right. So it's, it, and uh, Alexandra's room used to be purple. She loves purple. <laughs> and when I saw that manifest keychain in purple and it said manifest, I gave it to her as a Christmas gift. It's not funny. Go. So her, into, but again, her, so what you're, so like for any listeners who did that and go, oh my God, I knew she was going to say purple. Great. That was your intuition. Let's not discount it. Let's not say it's a coincidence. That was your intuition. How cool is that? Right. Mm-hmm. And for the, it, it's like, it's like you both played the most beautiful role. We needed both of these lessons today. Right. So uh-huh. thank you. Amazing. Is that and for that anyone, is? Not rehearsed. This is like, exactly. Oh and for, for anyone who is listening that didn't see purple or still doesn't see purple, you might see like the slightest, faintest purple later, uh-huh. or now purple is going to be on your consciousness. You're going to see it yeah. throughout your day. Right. So the idea of the, I, see um, purple behind you. <laughs> I didn't see that picture right there. Picture. Yeah. I keep going to your, oh yeah. So there's so, right. So it's like, I didn't even know what color I was going to say when I'm channeling, wow. I just kind of share. And then it's like, I didn't even look. And then now it's like, now I'm going to see purple. So we're all going to see purple a little bit more today than we would have after we listened to this. Right. So the idea well, is, is that, question. but I don't mean to interrupt you, but for example, I'm supposed to go out to dinner with a friend for a birthday. My other girlfriend doesn't want to go because we were both a little concerned um, because she's coming further to me. And we were concerned about the driving with our other friend. Um, that's because of the weather. So we rescheduled. So you're telling me that like, we should not have been now I'm finding out the weather's probably going to be much later on, but that prevented us from then going tonight. So if you were living in Connecticut and you had a bad forecast, would you still not know the forecast? That's her intuition. I don't think you want to give you an example. No, exactly. Yes. Alexander. Exactly. Okay. I was invited to an event. Okay. Okay. My intuition for whatever reason, I saw rain. The forecast, no rain. I could not bring myself to say yes to this event. I okay. just couldn't. Um, it couldn't get it to a line, whatever. Nothing in my logical stratosphere should have said not to go to this event. It right. was people I love. It was an experience I love. It was going to be gorgeous weather. I could not bring myself to do it. And I saw Again, it's intuition just comes in and floats out. It was like rain. That was it, right? Literally, even on the day of, and I had already decided to listen to my intuition, um, so I didn't go, but literally on the day of, 0% rain. 
zero percent rain. I think at one point later it was one percent rain. It fucking poured. It poured. It oh poured. Now listen for everyone who was there, and it's like you know, it's like okay, cool. Like that was what their experience was, and maybe their intuition they needed that, right? But if I had allowed the forecast to determine, I would have been the opposite, right? You saw a storm, so you didn't go. And then it was like, okay, you could have. I, I intuitively felt like it was not going to be a place. Cause you also have to think about like, I, I have Teddy with me everywhere. Yeah. I go, right? right. So, um, oh, it would have been so miserable. <laughs> and he just, yeah, I just, I flashed to like all the times, um, he has shown me where, he was left out in the rain by himself, you know? And anyway, so oh, it just, yes. I remember that. I remember yeah. that, you know? So like my intuition screamed at me. That was one of the times where it was like, I could not ignore my intuition because it was that out loud, that loud, but man, it poured and it poured and it poured. And my friends that were there were like, oh my God, how did you, man, the next time you don't go to something, maybe I'll think twice about <laughs> going. Right. Um, so, and, and on, on the other side, right. The amount of time, you know, being in Miami, living in a, in a place with hurricanes, if you listen to the media, right. Your nervous system is going to be just jacked. And so what happened was, um, I remember one of the times it had been, you know, maybe like my fourth time of hurricane, you know, it's like you, you get the amount of times hurricanes are supposed to come and they don't, or they do. And it's not that bad. Um, and I remember actually a couple different ones. It would be like, people would start projecting their fear on me right. or like going to the grocery store and like everything would be out of stock. I'm like, Oh my gosh. Well, of course it's all the box things, the actual like fruit and veggies, which is what I eat. They were plenty, but you know, papers, all the paper stuff's gone, all the, you know, uh, non-perishable stuff's gone, um, or perishable, whatever. And, um, and I would hear and feel it's going West or I would feel it's going East or I, I would know when I would, connect, when I would calm down, go into my intuition, I would ask, where is it going? Do, do I need to worry? Do I need to prepare? You know? And every time my intuition was correct. So again, this isn't about any of us needing to develop intuition. It's developing our confidence and our faith in our intuition. Cause I feel like, okay. Have either of you ever been, and, and I don't know, cause I don't, well, I don't know what your, your life prior to your husband was Debbie, but, um, your amazing husband, by the way, shout out to Vinny, but, um, <laughs> but the, uh, have you ever been in a relationship where at the end of it, you're like, man, how did I not see this sooner? Right. Maybe someone shows you their true colors at the end of a relationship. You're like, how did I miss that? Has that ever happened to either yeah. of you? Yeah. Okay. This happens with a lot of my clients where like, they're like kind of victimized by they're in a situation and they, or maybe a relationships that are ending and they're going, man, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. How did I not see it? I, you know, obviously I, my intuition is not that great because I didn't see it. And the question I always ask is, and I'll ask each of you is like, look back to the very first moment inside of knowing that person where something told you something was off. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like, when was it? Um, probably early on, early on at the beginning, like probably the first or second time hanging out with someone. Yes. Yes. So it's not, I, get, I tell you that because it's not our intuition, right? It's listening to our intuition. Right. It's like us not listening to our intuition is what's screwing us. It's right. not our intuition. It's not delaying, that we don't have delaying it, trying to rationalize dismissing and dismissing it dismissing it or making excuses or saying, but there's this part that's great. So this, this way I want to stay in this person's life, uh, relies, um, giving them chances and all of that. So but the forecast says 0% rain. Right. 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 So if the forecast says 0% rain, why am I seeing rain? that, that, that right. Versus right. like listening. And I will tell you the times I don't listen to my intuition. This happened recently. It's like, it screws me so big, you yeah. know? And when I say screws me, like nothing super bad, but I'm just talking like, that's when my overstimulation comes in. It's like, it's like my intuition is trying to partner with me going, right. Hey, if you go to that, um, 
like that's just not in vibrational alignment or that I'll, I'll give you another example right it was like um there was an event and again same thing like I love these people I want to go I'm so excited but I just couldn't get fully on board with it and I didn't know why and because I didn't know why I ignored it right so it's like when we wait for I call it the logicalizing, like we wait for the logic to match the intuition. Then we just put ourselves in situations where, and, and again, it wasn't bad, but it was like, when I got there, I realized, oh, that event was not a fit for me and Teddy. Right. 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 Just because of the way that it was set up. So I could have saved myself an hour drive. Gosh. Um, I ended up going over threshold and had a panic attack. So it, it was like, and panic attacks don't always make logical, rational sense either. It's all energy, right? So your intuition is so finely connected to and curated with your energy, your feeling, your sentience. It's a whole nother language that I feel like they missed when they gave us education, right? Because they, they teach us words, but they don't teach us energy. So we don't, in our society, we do not prioritize the language of energy, which is our intuition, which is our sentience, which is our knowingness. We don't prioritize that as high as our logic, our right. mind, which is what we're taught, which is what we're, you know, our whole education system is about. So when we can begin to start to balance the two or even allow intuition to be a little bit higher prioritized, I'm not saying screw logic. I'm not saying no. logic out the window, but when we can allow the calibration of intuition to be a higher dominant priority in our life than what it currently is, it radically transforms what you can access as far as joy and peace and love and manifestation and abundance. I got to show, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt you. My little, my fourth child, Jojo, look how adorable. Oh, hey. You know? oh, until he's 14. Okay. Uh, Hey, how are you, Vinny? Good to see you. Really I'm sorry. I had to get you. I just... can't wait to hear this one. I love all he, the ones well, with you. Wait, just show oh, same. Thank you. Joe. He's Look so cute. I know. It's good to see you. He's doing Reiki on him. Yeah. And his numbers got better. Everything blood got work better. Numbers. Blood work numbers. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. oh, good to see you too. Again, right? So it's the it's Reiki. Reiki is, which it was what your husband's able to do as well, right? Reiki yes. is a form of healing with speaking the sentient language of energy, right? Right, And it's the nice thing is our world is becoming more and more aware of this because science and technology is starting to catch up, right? Right. So the more proof we have, the more logic that we have, the more the gap between intuition and logic gets to close. But the reason that I live the life that I do is because I don't have to wait for the world to catch up for me to be in tune. Right. Yeah. Wait, so this, yeah. So for yeah. your clients, a lot of times they might come to you with issues of anxiety and stuff. Are you, so are you trying to tell them to listen to their intuition? What if they don't want to li listen to their intuition, but they want to learn how to deal with it deal with the anxiety, go through it despite the intuition, but learn how to manage the anxiety. Like you're avoiding, right? You're, 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 you're at a higher level. You're much more successful. You're able to avoid and listen to the intuition. If people don't want to listen to the intuition, are you still able to work with them on that level to help them achieve a serenity does that make sense? Like achieve the but serenity. I think a lot of people who go to Morgan want to tap into their intuition. It's not like, why would you, why would you seek Morgan out if you're not into listening? Well, it may have already happened. Into example, they want to seek, they want to listen to intuition, but it's already happened. What so something's mean? already happened or something is yeah, happening. But things will always happen. Right. So why would you just base it's it off of one thing that happens in your life when multiple situations are going to occur your whole life where you need to use your intuition? But I think it's abstract in a sense, like if somebody has anxiety, like, like they're flying or they're afraid they're going to get lost or, and they're somewhere. Okay. Happy. That makes more sense. Yeah. So, um, but what you're both saying, right. So just to validate, right. Alex, what Alexandra is validating here is yes. Most people, when it, when you come to me, it's like, you're, you're going to, you're going to cultivate your intuition. That's a part of the game. In fact, it, if you, and then I'll answer your question, Debbie, because it feels like it's a little bit separate, but 
you can either focus on anxiety or you could focus on intuition. Right. I always say that whatever you focus on is going to expand. So I always say, focus on the opposite of whatever you're trying. Like if you're, if you keep focusing on anxiety, you're feeding it, feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. Right. right? But if you focus on, okay, what's the opposite. So intuition is so in juxtaposition of the anxiety because anxiety is often like the body and the mind. And then um, you've got intuition. So cultivating the intuition helps you at least have um, another tool that offsets that. However, what I am hearing you say, and this is what I'm deeply in research of right now, is there are literally, part of anxiety is the nervous system, right? And, and the nervous system does have a mind of its own when it comes to anxiety in a lot of times. So when I have my own overstimulation moments or I go into a panic attack, it doesn't, it usually doesn't make rational sense right? Because what's happening too is it's like our nervous system is sensing something that is similar to something we experienced in the past. And then you time travel to the past, whether it's past life, right? I've said, you know, some people are afraid of, you know, flying because maybe there was an accident in the past life or they're afraid of cars or weather or um, snakes or whatever from I hate past squirrels. Life. I mean, I want to know what happened in my past life because I can't be a squirrel without screaming. Like, I'm not kidding. It's so weird. So so that's literally like a reactionary response, right? That doesn't make any logical sense in this experience, right? But also that could be something that maybe you were a child and you don't remember a memory and right. like you were feeding a squirrel and it bit you, something. I don't yeah, know. People right? always are like, were you attacked? And I was like, I don't think so. I don't know. And it could be past life. Right. right. But it could also be this life. But so often, um, you know, like as an example with Teddy, it is very, very, very vulnerable for me to socialize him with dogs even though he's, I mean, he, he, he has his own stuff, right? He's like a little, he's excited and he's nervous because he hasn't been, he hadn't been in his current past life, um, very socialized, but, but he's excited and he's friendly and he's still loving. Right. So I don't have reason to believe anything bad is going to happen, but I did have an aggressive dog before him who did not like dogs, who, um, I, when I would communicate with her, she was like, I didn't come here to be with dogs. I came here to be with humans. She liked humans. She just wasn't really a fan of dogs. She, she, so she didn't even want to go through the training process. And um, whereas Teddy is like, he really wants, he, he's, a, he's a social being. He's very extroverted. He wants dog friends. He wants human friends. He wants all the friends. Um, so for me, when I, when I walk into a socialization process with him, right, I time travel back to 13 years of an aggressive dog. So in those instances, it's not going to be like, just go into your intuition. So Debbie, that's your question, right? It's like, okay, it's not really just about the intuition. In those instances, we have to learn how to retrain, reprogram our nervous system. So the way to do that is to find the threshold and make sure that we're stretching the threshold, but not breaking the threshold to stretch it, but not to over, to go over it. It's okay if you do go over, cause you learn from that too, but it's a harder way to learn. The gentler way is to say like the way uh, a word someone used with me once is like tithing, right? Like it's like little by little by little, like drop by drop by drop. So it's expo- it's actually what I have done in a lot when I do training with Teddy as well, it's exposure training, right? Right. And what it does when I do exposure training with him, say I'm bringing him, you know, like I brought him to a car car wash and he, his, he was like, what is this? This is crazy. This is insane. Cause I need him to be able to be in all life scenarios. And it was like, he freaked out. Right. But if I bring him through the car wash again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, eventually he's like, cool car wash nervous system equals this is normal. And we have to do, or we get to do the same thing with our own nervous system for whatever it is that's causing us overstimulation. Right. If it's something we want to engage with. So for the socialization process for an animal, I have to, even though it's uncomfortable, I have to keep doing it until my nervous system is like, oh, okay. And I've gotten much better at it, but what I'm realizing is, and that was why that event that we went to wasn't in alignment for us and why my intuition was trying to tell me not to do it is there were so many, there was another dog there that, that, you know, what we would have had to go through the socialization process with, but there were so many people around. There was so much energy. It was not an environment that would have been even slightly conducive to being able to do exposure training for me in that process. 
right? And if it's not good for me, he's going to feel it. And it's not going to be good for him either. So I feel like the answer to really when it truly is something that's your nervous system is identify what the root is, like identify what's causing the reaction, like what's causing the fear and then try to create ways to do exposure to it. So if it's a flight, um, you know, can you find a really short flight or can you find like private, uh, you know, like a flight lessons for a smaller plane or something yeah, you know it's like example, not specifically yeah. related to me about flying but just trying to think of things yeah, no, that, that makes sense but yeah that will you know I for example I would love to get another dog but the irony is like I don't have that that um sixth sense that you have the intuition like Vinny and I always talk about getting one more dog now because I want to replace Jojo but I am so attached to him and I feel like in one way, if it was the right kind of dog, the right, another Shih Tzu or rescue or something that could make him keep him younger because whenever he goes away to the woman that watches him with her young dogs, he always comes back with a pep in his step and she says he does so well. And even when we take a walk, he loves other dogs, not to jump, but he just wags his tail like crazy. He's just got such a big heart, loving soul, so deep. And I'm like, am I hurting him by getting another dog? Am I hurting him if I don't get another dog? but I don't have an answer for that. It's not coming to me. Do I wait till he passes? You know, I know nothing will replace yeah. him when he does pass, mm -hmm. but that's something that I've toyed with for years. Alexander will know. I have all these websites okay. I follow. I'm worried about you think. Yeah, what do you think? So this is really common where someone thinks, uh, actually what you said at the beginning of, before you opened that up, right? You said, I don't have the sixth sense like you right. do. And it's like, I call bullshit. You do tap into your intuition. You're just tapping into fear more frequently because that's your more practice vibration. Right, because right? I analyze everything and then I have my husband that analyzes and it's very practical. So we're not fighting about it, but it's like we're discussing it. And it's like, when's the right time to get another pup and add to our, you know, like I don't have a crystal ball. Jojo's 14. Hopefully he'll live long, another five years, but who knows? Yeah. He's amazingly young looking and acting other than not hearing he only hears loud sounds he doesn't hear. He's pretty much deaf, uh, but he's like in his old age, he's gotten even more attention than ever before and cuter in some weird way. Like he's just such, we just, we have more time for him and my adult children love him. And part of me is like, maybe I should get another dog. So it, it feels like there's an opportunity just as far as if I'm feeling into the question and then also in a way to help the listener, it feels like there's this layer here of whenever you're trying to make a decision, yeah. take a moment to really like close your eyes. Actually, do you each have something you're trying to make a decision on? Cause I can give you, I can walk yeah. you through it. Is there something sure. in your life that you're like, huh, I'm kind of indecisive about what's my intuition? What's maybe fear. Yeah. Okay. So both of you just close your eyes. I'm going to just walk us through a quick exercise. Um, and for the, those of us listening, right. It's, or for the listeners, it's follow, follow this as well, but everyone just really think about, okay, what's something that I am trying to make a decision on. And I'd like to walk away from this exercise with what is actually my intuition and a little bit more clarity on what's intuition and what's fear. So what we're going to do first is we're just going to calm our nervous system. So we're going to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out and a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And we're just going to ignore any distractions going on around us. We're just going to allow our body to get as relaxed as we possibly can Continue taking deep breaths in and out, scanning our body for anything that needs to be relaxed and released. And any thoughts that come, just let them come and go. We'll get back to them in a few minutes. And from the state of calm, giving yourself permission to really feel into, I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna ask your intuition a question. I just want you to feel what it feels like just observing in a calm state, whatever comes up. If you were to say yes 
to whatever it is you're trying to make the decision of and move forward with it. How does that feel in your body? And just know where do you feel it? How do you feel? We'll talk about it in a second, but just for now, just feel it internally. Okay, this is weird because my dog- Oh, just... hold on a second. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it in a second. He's licking my hand. And then giving yourself the opportunity to, we're gonna actually just shake the body. We're just gonna shake the body. It's gonna shake it off. We're gonna shake off. Yes, okay. It allows us to just relax and release. And then we're just gonna take another deep breath in. And deep breath out. And now just observing whatever happens when I ask you the next question. Just observing. If you were to say no to whatever it is that you're thinking about doing and you were to not do it and you were to just leave that behind, how does that feel in your body? And just observe what it feels like or what visions come up. And then just feeling through, we're gonna go back to if the yes felt like a stronger desire for you once we tapped in, or if the no felt stronger, whichever one felt stronger, I want you to go to that one. There's no right or wrong, just whichever one felt like it gave you a stronger clarity of alignment. So go back into that and then feel into what are all of the yeah buts. I want you to let all of the yeah but thoughts swirl through your mind. You're not going to say them out loud. You're just going to let them swirl through your mind. I want you to begin to feel how this doubt and fear feels in your body and how it's different than intuition. And just notice the difference between fear, the yeah buts, and how you felt when you had clarity. Where do you feel it different in the body when you're in fear? And we're not going to stay here too long because fear and doubt sucks. So let's go ahead and just shake it off. We're going to shake it off. <clears throat> we're going to take a deep breath in. Ooh, come back into the room. And then just if you want to share... Um, in doing that quick little exercise, which you can do for decisions, what did you notice in the difference between intuition and fear for you? You can start. I would say like the yes decision gave me like fear. And like, I felt like my heart rate a little bit more, like, you know, my stomach turned like butterflies kind of like flipping. And then when I thought of the no decision, I felt like relaxed and, you know, I didn't feel any visceral reaction to it. It was like totally fine. It wasn't like my heart was going fast. I was getting like, you know, thinking about it and, and everything like that. And then um, I would say like the fear reminded me a lot of how I felt with the yes. Like, yeah, yeah. there's a subtle nuance between fear and excitement or fear and exhil exhilaration. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is so, this is so important. So it feels like then you get to feel into a deeper, you would repeat that exercise and you would say, okay, when was a moment in my life where I felt exhilarated? Mm -hmm. And where was a moment in my life where I felt fear so that you could actually feel between the difference between what's what, if you give you like knowing what you know now, like when you look back on your life of what's fear and exhilaration, which, which one do you think that yes was? Um, I would say like, yeah, I mean, I, well, I think in my case, like the no was like the right thing to do. And then the yes was the fear and like exhilaration, but it's just speak for, in a bad way. Yeah. So exhilaration is, is something that's actually really beautiful, right? It's like, oh my God, 
I'm going to do this thing and it's giving me like excitement, but that kind of excitement can sometimes transient into um, aggression uh, or uh, anxiety, um, which is common in animals. And we see that so clearly, but we forget to see that in ourselves. So sometimes it's hard though, Alex, in a situation where maybe your mind thinks you should say yes to it, but you actually don't want to, you're like, no. So this helps you really decide and discern what it is. And so often we just forget to take the time to check in what's what. Right. Right. Yeah. What about you, Debbie? I felt it was sort of hard to separate it because I don't have a concrete idea of timing and all. So I was rationalizing and maybe fantasizing that it would be fine. Minus like if I was to take this event and make it happen, because it wasn't really reality right now so it's sort of to me a cross between the two I didn't really feel a difference I just felt more of a calmness thinking about if I was to take the leap and do what I wanted to do with this particular idea yeah so to mirror back to you right um sometimes there are two paths that are beautiful and sometimes there is no clear yes or no Right. right. Like there, I had a professor in school. I think it's the only thing I learned in school um, when I look back, but she taught a communications course where she would give you an exam and all of the answers would be correct answers. Wow. And she would pick what she felt was the most correct answer. And then you could in front of everyone, it was like a 200 room lecture in front of everyone, you could stand up and you could communicate why you felt your answer was the most correct answer. And if you did, and she agreed, then it would be where she would allow everyone who already got the correct answer for hers to keep theirs. And she'd give anyone who had the answer that you would um, communicate, you know, and she'd give you that point. What that taught me and the reason she did that was there's oftentimes in life there, it's not black or white, it's not right or wrong. There's so many different things that could be a path that is a beautiful path for us. So right. Debbie, it sounds like for you is there is no right or wrong. And it feels like there's some, there's some relaxation that you could have inside of that, right? Some release. Cause it feels like a part of what's causing your tension is you think there's a right or wrong. And it, it sounds like, Hey, if you did, that would be beautiful. And if you didn't, that's okay. Um, what I will say is both of you mentioned calm. So when you're in your intuition, and this is something I hear from 99.999% of people when they're in their intuition, there's a calm energy of intuition, right? right? So that's where it's like, oh, Ocala flies away. You know, it's like comes in, (laughs) flies away. Rain came in, fly away, right? And it's like, their intuition is not repetitive. It's not circular. When I say intuition screaming at me, I mean, I literally can feel it, not that I'm hearing it. Um, but also I wanted to validate or mirror back Debbie is that when you were thinking of the fantasy, you were like, ha ha, he's licking my hand. He came over to participate and said, Hey, I like, I like that. If you did, it was perfect. The, The timing, it was perfect because of the fact that if she hadn't said like, you didn't say it later, you only said it during. So if you hadn't said it during I wouldn't have even known to connect the dot. So it actually worked out so beautifully. Like he's um, literally. <laughs> yeah. So it's understanding that there's this piece here of there's not always right or wrong. And also the being is around, like it t- technically it has to do with him and he's telling you. Like, I, don't want to take away from him. I don't want to take away from him. That's the bottom but, line. But really he's want- going, it would be okay. Okay. <laughs> right. So, but it's also like, it'll be okay either way. So it's just understanding, like we have these different things that we can do. Yes. That allow us to become in more mastery of ourselves. Right. And, and I know, I know Alexandra mentioned some topics um, and I know that you could relate to when it comes to your health, like Serena Williams and if Alexander wants to take it from there, there was another, there was a couple examples of listening to your own body with related to stars and people that have had things happen um, the gymnast, Simone, Simone Biles. Yeah. I don't know if you want to speak about that. The whole idea of everything we're talking about is you beginning to become more and more in mastery of yourself, your mental, like you taking more ownership for your mental health, you taking more ownership for your physical health. And 
what I see often inside this world is that we outsource it. We outsource our mental health to a therapist. We outsource our our physical health to a doctor or a practitioner Mm -hmm. or a specialist. Um, Or we may outsource our, um, you know, goals to a coach. But what I also see is we can partner. It can be an and, right? right? Where we can partner, where we can say, hey, I'm going to be committed to being the master of getting to know myself and my, what I need in my mental health, what I need in my physical health, what I need in my goals, et cetera, et cetera. And then you partner with people, right? And when you partner with someone, it's like, okay, you're an and, you're an asset, you're, you're, you're part of the team, but you're not the end all be all. And so right. the two examples I have of that are one is um, Simone Biles was, uh, is like one of the world's most elite gymnasts. I was a gymnast, so I really love gymnastics. And, um, she made a personal decision and call to pull herself out of something because uh, it was, you know, it was literally an event that this is like, could have been a a gold medal for her. She decided to pull herself out because she said she knew her mental health so well. She was so connected to it that she just couldn't get her head in it. And the world destroyed her. Like the, the, the world had so many opinions about what she should have done or how she should have done it. And that she, you know, all of these things that like, oh, she, she let us down and this, and that. And it's like, I saw that. And I was like, why does anyone feel like they have any right to mm-hmm. comment on what someone else does for their own mental health. Right. Right. And there's this thing that happens where it's like, oh, the audacity that she would have and who does she think she is? And it's to me, it's like this is someone who's so elite in her ability to understand her mental faculties and her mental emotional health that she was able to not only make a decision of what was best for her and her own physical body, that she could have injured herself if she wouldn't have been able to do the, um, that literally, which as a gymnast, it's like, it has to happen in the head before right. it happens in the body. That's literally right. how I learned everything I did in gymnastics. Um, so if it, if she, if you can't have the origination point, right, then it's like, how do you get the outcome? And people could say, oh, it's muscle memory. It's this and that. And it's like, these are people at home. These are not gymnasts saying this, right. by the way, these are not people who are also studying the same craft she has. These are people who are just like, um, like Brené Brown says, if you're not in the arena of life, getting your ass kicked, they don't want your opinion. Right. So these are people mm-hmm. up in the balcony seats, having an opinion about someone who's in the arena. Right. And, um, it versus like, just allowing us to look at that and go, wow, this is someone who's so masterful at her mental health. I could learn more about that for myself. Right. So that was one of the things that came to mind was just like the celebration of her own ability to be so in tune with herself that she didn't need someone else's permission to make a decision for herself, which I think we could all learn from. The other thing is Serena Williams. I watched a documentary, a docu-series that she did on HBO Max, I think it was. And when she was giving birth to her daughter, she could feel something happening in her body. I don't remember exactly what it was, but she knew exactly what it was. She said, it's this, this, and this. And she said, I need this scan and this scan. They said, that's not what's happening. You don't need that. That's unnecessary. And she had to push and push and push and push to advocate to get the test when they did the test that she asked for exactly what she said was going on in her body was going on in her body. And what she said was this layer of, you have to advocate for yourself. And the only way that you can truly advocate for yourself is to know yourself. And as an athlete, she's so well connected with her body, her physical body that she knew. So, so Simone Biles is like that mental health layer. Right. And then Mm -hmm. Serena Williams is this physical health layer of you be so in tune with your own body that, you know, and you don't need someone else to tell you or give you permission to know what's going on with your body. You're like, no, this is, and you push and you push and you push and you advocate for yourself. So I feel like this whole layer of giving yourself permission to stop trying to be rescued from the world outside of you. Stop expecting someone else 
to be responsible for your mental health or your physical health, not that they can't contribute, not that they can't partner with you, but take ownership, take responsibility. And if someone else wants to shame you, right? I, I've encountered a lot of my own um, experiences where people don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing for my own mental health or for right. my own physical health. And um, I'll tell you if you care more about what other people think than you do about your own health, you will drown in this world mm -hmm. physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And I know because I have gone through many moments of drowning and, um, and, and I still, this is something I still have to actively condition myself into is like, I'm the master of me. Right. Right. I know me better than anyone else. I have been with me longer than anyone else has ever been with me. You have been with you longer than anyone else has ever been with you. Right. And so it's giving yourself permission to trust your intuition, to trust your body, to trust the knowingness and to really take the journey to go inside your mind and your body to really understand what does it need? What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Like yeah. make sure you are a priority in your own life. And I think those are so important for empaths, for humans in general, and definitely for our mental and physical health on our journeys. Yeah. Wow. It's so true. It's such good examples as well, because when you are in the public eye, you know, you really see what, you know, everyone has an opinion on you. Everyone has a thought about you, but when you see people who you look up to in the public eye that are looking out for their mental health and their physical health, hopefully it'll inspire others in their daily life to say, okay, I know something's wrong, but I didn't want to make waves with my doctor, or I didn't think that it's okay that I could have these thoughts for my mental health. And then when you see people coming forward and being brave enough to admit that and share their experiences, it can help others want to you know, tap into their own spiritual, spirituality and mental health and physical health. So that is always so inspiring. One, one story that really stands out with me was that, um, that beauty queen, Miss, I don't know what, what was she, I was there, Miss, you cannot, I don't know, not Miss Connecticut, Miss USA or Miss, one of the beauty pageant, um, that beautiful girl that just passed a few weeks ago that committed suicide and nobody said they knew anything that she was a, she had high functioning anxiety or depression. That was such a sad, tragic story for me. Like I didn't even know about her um, or anything until one of my friend's daughters posted, who's very into the whole beauty pageant, uh, you know, connection. And I was just so shocked from, you know, listening and reading everything from the mothers to the relatives, to the friends, to the coworkers, not having any idea that this woman was suffering. And from the outside, she was a beautiful, beautiful soul inside too. Yeah, I, I'm always so shocked when people listen to their bodies, but can't control the, the suicidal ideation. And that's very There's, sad and tragic. No, this is such a powerful piece. Uh, one is I wish more people could understand and have compassion for happiness and anxiety can coexist. Right. Right. It's, um, you can be a genuinely happy, excited, loving, optimistic being and still have overstimulation because you're human. Hello. Right. And still have suicidal thoughts. Right. I think people are actually really shocked. I'm pretty open about talking about it, but like, I absolutely experience the thoughts of suicide, like being like, man, it would be so much easier to not be in this dimension. Cause I know what other dimensions feel like. And they're infinitely higher levity than this. There's so much density in the human experience. So I think that's another thing that's really common as you do ascend in your spiritual journey is, um, you know, sometimes it's like, man, checking out of this place doesn't sound so bad. Right. But I think it's also the more we can talk about it, the more that we can realize like, oh, that doesn't make me, that doesn't make anything wrong with me. It doesn't mean I'm going to do it right. Versus it feels like tapping into the vibration of what that woman went through is when you don't have an outlet that you feel like you can express, like when you don't have support, when you don't have community, when you aren't, when you don't have any places or spaces in your life where you feel like you can be who you are, you're more likely to drown in the darkness. And right? you wonder, yeah, and you wonder, 
did she seek out help or did she just say, I want to end it. I just don't see any rainbow at the end of the tunnel and that this would just end my pain. Like it just, it's so crazy to me that people are saying, well, there had to have been signs, there had to have been signs, but they're calling it function. I don't know if they called it functional anxiety or functional depression. To me, she hit it. She hit it from her closest companions, which is crazy to me. So, and it just seems so to me, I'm, I'm, that would be so scary to end it that way, the way she just jumped off a building and ended it. Um, and, and it's, it, they always say it's so selfish, but she was in so much pain. She, at th that moment, she's not thinking about being selfish, right? She's thinking about ending her pain and not wanting to burden her loved ones, probably. Not so much being selfish. So I know people feel it's a selfish act, but it's not like they're in the right mind. People, when they do that, are not going to be able to like do your type of thing and bring themselves to a calmer place to take a, a more positive step to helping that anxiety be relieved, right? They just feel this is, there's no choice. I just think it's so important for us to um, figure out what in our own life we can begin to focus on and ask support on or do our own research on or whatever, whether it's your nervous system, whether it's your thresholds, whether it's your intuition, it's like finding something that allows you to be able to focus on progress and moving in a direction that is going to allow you to be in higher alignment with yourself and in fuller authenticity of yourself. What happens is when we don't seek help, when we don't shine the light on our own shadows and our own demons. You know, I have a, a shirt that says, that I made that said snuggle with your demons, right? When we're not willing to like get in bed with our demons and snuggle and be like, all right, tell me what's up, what's going on. Um, then we can go into these toxic positivity states. Right. But that's why I'm saying like, even the question, it, it, it feels like the world is so black or white where it's, I either get to be happy or I get to be anxious. And then we get well, if I'm anxious, then maybe I'm not happy and that da, 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 versus like, no, I'm happy. And I experience overstimulation. Right. And I feel like part of the work I'm doing in this world is what if we just normalize that that's part of the human experience. Right. Right. What if we normalize that, you know, especially the more that we open ourselves to extrasensory experience for the beings that want to take that path and journey to open up their psychic portals and, and explore and play in their intuition. And when I say psychic, I don't mean like, you know, a crystal ball and I'm going, oh, uh, Cleo and da, 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 and your future is this. That's not what I mean. I mean, like extrasensory uh, experience where you see things, know things, feel things beyond the logic. Right. And um, I feel like when you when you consciously explore that journey, it's so important to give yourself permission to just go, Hey, this is part of the package over simulation is going to come with it. I'm going to figure out, you know, how do I, and again, this is what I'm researching and really deeply and very experientially for the third book. It's how do I partner with my nervous system? Right. And how do I give myself permission to go? Yeah. Suicidal thoughts are normal. Overstimulation is normal. Anxiety is normal. Like these are just part of the human experience. But I think even just the label of it is like, oh, it's only some of us have it. So if you do and I don't, there's something wrong with me, right? I think shame prevents us from giving ourselves the opportunity to ask for help, right? And so, but man, when you do, when you, when you, have the right community of people around you, whether it's friends or spiritual practitioners, or, I mean, therapy, a therapist, uh, you know, uh, a life coach, uh, a spiritual advisor, a, like there's so many different things that you could have mm -hmm. to build. I have like literally a community of support around me in that way. And then I also have friends and I also have, you know, you guys and different people that I can connect with and family and, and, and so it's just, and for some people listening, they may go, I don't have anything. Right. Right. And it's like, okay, let's start just like find one being that can support you, that can hold space for you, that you can ask for help. I remember someone I um, was friends with, oh, this always hits me really hard emotionally. Um, not hard, but it hits me in my heart. Um, 
I had talked to them for years about therapy that I felt like, man, therapy would be so good for things you're experiencing. And it was a guy and he really experienced a lot of his own subconscious shame. I don't think he even realized it, but his subconscious shame of what that would mean about him as a person, if he needed therapy and especially him as a man and blah, blah, blah. And then he started therapy and it was a month, a few months after he was in therapy, he came to me and it was like, he was really emotional and in the most beautiful way about it. And he was like, I wish everyone did this. I really, I really wish, and I'm not a therapist. So I'm not plugging anything. This is just, you know, he, but he was like, and, and, and his insurance at work covered it. Right. So it was like, he had this thing that he could access and he didn't even, he wasn't even using it, but he was like, man, I just, everything I thought it would be, it wasn't, and it's even better. And like, he just was learning about who he was and he had a safe space to unpack things. And, um, so yeah, I just feel like the more that we're able to focus on ourselves and stop focusing on anyone else, right? Like I can feel, I feel it, you know, I, I feel a lot of things, which I feel a lot of things, but, um, I can feel when someone has an opinion about how I navigate through my world. And it's like, dude, focus on yourself, take that energy, focus on yourself. Like all you're doing is pouring out energy that you could be using for yourself. And so it's the same thing. It's like, let's have more compassion for one another and curiosity, right? If someone's doing something, why don't we just get curious? Like, Hmm, I wonder what that's all about versus judging or thinking that they're trying to work a system or it's like, it's like understanding, um, you, you never truly understand someone unless you are them, (laughs) which means you can't right? you know, or you're walking in some of the same shoes. So I just feel like, I don't know when I looked at Simone Biles and Serena Williams, I was like, yes, to me, it's thank you for being these powerful mirrors in the world of what it looks like to be so anchored in your authenticity that even when the whole world is watching, you're not willing to sell yourself out. Yeah. The world can use a lot more authenticity and a lot more kindness. I totally feel that. But Morgan, thank you so much for being here with us. I want you to tell all the listeners where they can find you. Do you have any details on when you think the third book will be done? I can't wait for that. Um, And yeah, where can everyone find you in your epic, sexy life? Oh, I'm so excited about the third book. Um, I don't have a a timeline yet, but I feel like it'll definitely be in this year. Um, And uh, oh, it's really, really juicy. This one's just very different vibrationally, but also equally as powerful. It's like each book I have, this is my third book. Each book is like a cousin, right? They're all kind of related, but they're all very different. Right. Um, so, but where you can find the other books and also, um, just information about who I am and what I do and booking a session or anything like that is you can go to my website at www.epicsexyu.com. So that's E P I C S E X Y Y O U.com. And then I'm on Instagram at Epic Sexy U and I am on Facebook. Just, you would have to look up Morgan field. I never know what the URL is for that, but I'm on Facebook quite a bit more than I am on Instagram. I need to get better at that. But, um, but yeah, I just feel like there's something really beautiful about if this resonated with you, if you are able to follow and stay connected then to whatever it is that I'm curating and creating, it'll really help you continuously. It's like, you know, being in the vibration of, even if I post something, that's just like a picture of me and my dog doing something, you're getting the vibrational nuances of what I'm learning. It's like each of us has different codes that we're activating in the world. And so if anything I said resonated, it's like, that will definitely help you stay more and more in the path of intuition and expansion and, you know, nervous system regulation and anxiety and all of those layers. Um, and then the first two books I have, the first one is Epic Sexy You. And that one was for self-love. So just like all of the different ways that you can create an amazing relationship with yourself. And the second one is called Powerful as Fuck. Both of those are on Amazon. And Powerful as Fuck is all about really fine tuning in the mastery of how do you take radical ownership for every single layer of your life and just slay it. So if you're struggling, I wouldn't recommend reading that book. That's for like, if you're already a high achiever, um, and you want to take yourself to the next level, that's amazing. And then definitely Epic Sexy, you will just help you have an amazing relationship with yourself. Thank you so much, Morgan. And we look forward to talking with you next time and everyone out there embark on your spiritual journey because it's amazing.
It is. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. He loves having you. And if you have a furry friend, include him or her as well. Because we love our animals. Yeah.